One of the more important developments that has uh, been a result of the abundance of natural gas that we have in North America as a result of the shale plays is this idea of starting to export uh, liquefied natural gas. Um, as more and more production grew, producers were looking for different outlets and we were importing less and less natural gas um, over time. So this is sort of a silver lining that we're hoping will happen by the end of 2015 or uh, at the latest early 2016. Here's just uh, pictures of four of the existing uh, LNG import facilities that we have in the United States. And you can actually see there's one off of uh, Massachusetts, one off of Georgia, one off of Maryland, and one of three that we have in the uh, Gulf Coast region. Now, what is liquefied natural gas? It's natural gas that's cooled to a minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, what this does is it reduces the volume by over 600 times, which it makes it easier to transport and store. So, in other words, um, let's just say if we had uh, a cubic foot of natural gas, there's a certain amount of BTU within that, but the same cubic foot of, na of uh, liquefied natural gas would have 600 times the heating value. So you can see where storing the liquid or transporting the liquid, you are actually storing and transporting a much, much higher heating value than with uh, pure methane. So you can see here, a ton of liquefied natural gas is equivalent to 47 MMBTUs or 47 million BTU. And one ocean-going LNG tanker can hold the equivalent of three BCF of natural gas. Uh, you can see here the main sources of liquefied natural gas that the U.S. Um, had been importing back in 2012. You can just see some of the countries here, the most coming from Trinidad and Tobago, following by Qatar. Qatar is still uh, the world's largest exporter of LNG, and then smaller uh, pieces coming from three other regions. And it is, of course, a global market. As I mentioned, you can see Qatar is in the number one spot at the moment, followed by Malaysia and Australia. Um, the fact is Australia has some major projects going on off their west coast, not only um, uh, offshore production of natural gas, but large facilities, one in particular being the Gorgon Project, um, which has ExxonMobil as a partner. Uh, they will probably overtake Qatar in the number one spot within the uh, next year or so. And then the markets, you can see Japan is the uh, largest importer of LNG. Japan has absolutely no natural gas production themselves, likewise with South Korea. And so they have to import 100% of the natural gas that they do consume. Uh, China in the third slot. Now China has some natural gas reserves, but they're not developed yet. They actually have some shale plays. Pricing around the world um, varies from region to region. In Japan, they price LNG landed off of the price of crude oil that's imported, the so-called Japanese cocktail. Um, what it amounts to is just the average price uh, for the crude oil that's been purchased as cleared through their customs. Um, and so it really it's Japanese cleared customs uh, crude pricing, but it's just referred to as the Japanese cocktail. Um, in Korea and Taiwan, again, it's, it's the price of LNG landed is tied to the uh, BTU equivalent basket of crude oil postings. Um, in the UK, continental Europe, and Southeast Asia, it's a combination of oil and coal prices. Again, converted to a BTU basis, uh, and then the pricing for LNG on a BTU basis uh, is the equivalent. Now, in the United States and Canada, we have been traditional importers, uh, and we have very limited export facilities, but we have a competitive natural gas marketplace. Um, as, as you all know from your studying in earlier lessons, we have the New York Mercantile Exchange, so we have an open active competitive marketplace for natural gas. Now, Russia, China, and the Middle East, um, they regulate the price, the various uh, countries, the governments do, and they actually subsidize the price for their citizens. You can see here that because of the growth in the shale gas, uh, we have you know, steadily uh, imp declined our imports um, over the years. Now, the U.S. as an exporter, um, some of the reasons that make sense for us, we do have a surplus gas supply. The shale plays and the tight formations uh, have resulted in abundant, relatively cheap supply of natural gas. Uh, $3 or less is an extremely cheap price for natural gas. And the EIA estimates that, estimates that we're producing about 3 BCF a day more supply than we have market for. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, we have a competitive natural gas-based pricing market. 
Um, this is actually causing some renegotiations of some of the existing global contracts. In other words, Japan uh, sees the coming of LNG exports by the United States, and so they're already talking to some of their uh, suppliers and saying, you know, look, we want to get off of this crude oil pricing uh, type of mechanism in our contracts and convert over to some type of natural gas index. Uh, we have existing LNG import facilities, those uh, pictures I showed you in the beginning, uh, and we actually, believe it or not, we are exporting uh, virtually at the moment. The Since we no longer need uh, natural gas imports in the form of LNG, what's happening is those entities in the United States who have contracted for tanker loads are literally selling them uh, mid-sea, so to speak, sending them to different uh, ports rather than coming to the United States. And then we actually have had for about 20 years a small LNG export facility um, off the coast of Alaska uh, in a point called Kenai, and that's oper been operated by ConocoPhillips. You can see here now the um, red squares represent existing LNG points, uh, again, off of Massachusetts, uh, Cove Point, Maryland, Elba Island, Georgia, and then we have about four in the Gulf Coast area. Now these are going to be the logical uh, facilities to export. They have about 60 to 70 percent of the infrastructure in place already. They can handle tankers uh, for offloading. They have on uh, onshore storage. They have connections with pipeline companies. So what they're doing is they're building the gasification, excuse me, the liquefaction trains. We talked about the fact that uh, the natural gas has to be super cooled. Well, that takes a uh, liquefaction facility or train um, to be built. Uh, so in other words, they've got a lot of the infrastructure already in place. So some of these other companies that believe they're going to dive into this particular uh, arena are not going to have the facilities. It's going to cost them a considerable amount more uh, investment. You can see here, of course, uh, the natural gas exports and re-exports by country. Um, again, we have uh, declined uh, in terms of our, our imports, and then all of a sudden you can see we've actually started to, to do some exporting. And then the ways that it gets to a market, again, this is that logistics and value chain we talked about for natural gas. In the case of uh, exporting LNG, you can see here that the wellhead gas is going to move by pipeline to the liquefaction facility uh, and then it gets shipped to a particular port of entry where it's regasified uh, and then distributed to the various areas of need. So it's sort of the uh, opposite process that we've been used to for decades now where we actually receive the LNG and we regasify it and we utilize it uh, through the pipeline system to the various end users. Pricing wise, again, here in the United States, we've got a financial natural gas forward market, which you're familiar with, is the NYMEX provides price discovery, so everyone knows what the price is. Now, just currently, based on the one year average price for natural gas at Henry Hub, it's approximately $3.05 at the time that I put this particular lecture together. Now, these are the estimated supply chain costs, okay, in US dollars per MM BTU. Uh, approximately $2.15 represents the process for the liquefaction. Uh, shipping overseas is about $1.25. Regasification at the new port of entry is approximately $0.70 cents per MMBTU. So you have total costs of about $4.10. So in this particular situation, you're really around $7.15. And I apologize, this still says $7.05 on it. Now, when we compare that to world pricing, you can see that there are not that many places in which current LNG exporters can make money at $7.15. Now, throughout Asia, that's still a pretty good deal, and they're still going to make money in parts of South America. But over in Europe, you could not at the present time um, export LNG and make money over there. Now, this situation has dramatically changed. One of the um, uh, events that created impetus for the U.S. to consider exporting LNG had to be uh, back in March of 2011 with the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant disaster in Japan. As I mentioned earlier, Japan is solely dependent on imports uh, for natural gas and imports in the form of LNG. Well, at the time, they shut down all of their nuclear power plants. So the demand for natural gas in Japan spiked, and we were seeing prices upwards of $14 per MMBTU. So you can imagine at the time, uh, those planning the LNG export facilities out of the United States were uh, expecting 
extremely uh, lucrative business and very, very large uh, profit margins. Such is, is not the case today. And in fact, Japan is looking at relicensing uh, their nuclear power plants again. So the question is going to become at the end of 2015 or early 2016, when we actually start to export LNG into the global market and become a global player in natural gas, what will the prices be at that time? Now these are some of the proposed terminals. Um, these are uh, facilities who have already been granted permits, um, but not necessarily uh, have been um, started, excuse me, started con uh, construction or gotten all the um, capital investment that they currently need. Now, from a regulatory standpoint, the issues for uh, U.S. entities to be exporters, first you have regulatory. The Department of Energy uh, provides the first tier of approvals. Now, back in um, uh, 1938, we had the Natural Gas Act, and it allowed for the exportation of natural gas to countries which have free trade agreements with the United States um, to be an automatic process. So the DOE automatically grants um, permits to entities wishing to export LNG to any country with which the United States has a free trade agreement. Now, there has to be special approval if those same entities wish to sell LNG to non-FTA countries. Um, and as the moment, we have over 40 permits that have been filed with the Department of Energy. Now, that's the easy part. Now, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which, as we talked about before, has jurisdiction over all natural gas pipeline facilities, um, they, in fact, uh, are going to have to do the final approvals. Um, and again, getting back to the Natural Gas Act of 1938, there is a Section 7C, and that is a requirement that a certificate be filed with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for all new facilities. So FERC is going to want to see the, the project plan, the uh, contracted uh, customers for the LNG exports, the environmental impact studies, uh, and anything else that uh, would lead to ultimate approval by FERC. Um, and then from a market standpoint, one of the issues is the end users versus the producers. Producers want this market. It represents a substantial increase in demand uh, for natural gas in the United States. However, the end users uh, throughout the U.S. are going to become concerned about a rise in natural gas prices as a result. Some of the other issues involved, the legislative issues, you've got, you know, on the federal level, you're going to have senators and congressmen from the consuming states who are going to be concerned about rising prices once we start to, to export it. And then the same thing at the state level. They're going to be concerned, especially the non-natural gas producing states are going to be concerned about uh, rising natural gas prices. And then in certain states, there's going to be the concern about fracking. Um, and then environmental groups are opposed to LNG exportation uh, because they believe that all of this gas that's going to be exported is coming from uh, wells where the, it's shale and it has to be fracked, and that's, that's not the case. We have a, a, uh, an interstate pipeline grid throughout North America, and so the gas is commingled, so no specific source goes right to these LNG export facilities.